I want to introduce our next panel. We've talked a lot about faith-based collaboration. We've talked a lot about how the faith community can be involved. And I thought when talking to Sarah that it would be good to bring a live at five. I'm talking about something that is up and running, that represents a collaboration of now 13, I think we're up to 15 now, 15 houses of worship. It is citywide uh, where it integrates a lot of the things that you heard in the morning are actual program pieces that is happening right now. And what we thought we would do is to bring uh, a cross section of the, uh, of the partnership to talk about how they, in, uh, how they plug into the different program pieces. I would say that this model can work with any house of worship. So while this is uh, born out of the Christian community, I challenge you to think and to hear that it can work in any house of worship. Somebody say, it can work? In any house of worship. I just want to make sure that you were hearing me. So uh, I'm going to ask if Dr. Mason would kick us off um, and just give the history of the organization. And then Bishop will follow and talk about, from the leader's perspective, what does it take to make this happen? And then representing, and I want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Elder, uh, Pastor, <laughs> Doctor, <laughs> my dear friend Daryl uh, Thomas. And he came at relatively the last moment as one of our participants got called away. And he will talk about uh, the initiative from his perspective. And last but not least, Sister Veronica Gordon, who does the training for uh, the sites, to be host sites, will talk about her work. And then what time we have, we will take questions, comments, thoughts, or feelings. I'm just going to challenge each and every one of you uh, to be succinct. Uh, we don't have to serve the whole meal but just give enough of the hors d'oeuvres to make people want some more. How's that? All right, so in that order, Dr. Mason will kick off and he will give us the history of the Casey Family Ministry Partnership, Faith-Based Partnership. Good afternoon, and I want to thank uh, my brother, Reverend Dr. Alfonso Wyatt. Uh, we've worked together for many, many years now on uh, a number of different projects. Uh, and good afternoon to each one of you. I'm going to try to move my head around because we are really configured in a different kind of way. Amen. We got tables back in the back. We got people to the left and people to the right. We, we're going to try to reach all the way back to the back. <coughs> Casey Family Programs Foundation. Casey Family Programs Foundation. Uh, to give you some background on this. William Casey, the founder of the uh, foundation, uh, that is the organization that uh, owns United Parcel Services. Uh, and many, many years ago, while uh, beginning uh, United Parcel Services, which was a messenger service, uh, William Casey noted that a number of the people who were working for him a number of those persons had various family issues uh, 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 and so there was an interest in young people and particularly uh, young people in foster care. Uh, we're talking 60, 70 years ago. So that's sort of the backdrop for what, uh, for what I'm about to say. Casey Family Programs Foundation, which is based in Seattle, Washington, uh, has the, uh, one of their headquarter offices here in uh, downtown Manhattan. Several years ago, a uh, number of you may have remembered, uh, we had a commissioner here in New York City of, of ACS, William Bell. William Bell now is the CEO of Casey Family Programs in Seattle, Washington. So several years ago, one of the interests that um, uh, Commissioner Bell had was, 
what happens to all of the young people who are in foster care who've aged out? Uh, Alfonso White and I had a conversation with him several years ago when both of us uh, were working uh, uh, either as students or, and, and I'm on the faculty and, and, and running a program here at New York Theological Seminary here in this building. And that conversation was how can we engage and involve churches more in this process with Administration for Children's Services, with Casey Family Programs, to work uh, with uh, our young people in foster care and vulnerable families. So about five years ago, uh, we had a major conference in Seattle, Washington, where we had religious leaders from around the country. And out of that conference, uh, there were three programs developed. One program is in Atlanta, Georgia at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, that was the former a church of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., now pastored by Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. So that's one program. Another one uh, run by uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, A. Lincoln James in Richmond, Virginia. And this one here in New York City. And part of the goal for the Casey Family Programs, uh, a program devoted to, to, to working, is to reduce the number of young people in foster care by 50% in the year 2020. So New York City has the distinction of having one of three national programs uh, whose goal is to reduce the number of foster care, uh, young people in foster care by 50% in the year 2020. In that program, we have churches. Uh, Bishop Nelson uh, will, will talk about uh, what's going on in his church, the Church of God uh, in East Flatbush. We have churches in all five boroughs. And we work with seminarians who are in graduate school and seminary who are assigned as part of their field placement for a year to work with these uh, programs. We work with Administration for Children's Services and we work uh, with uh, Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. Uh, and that's sort of the structural part of that. Uh, in, in my remaining uh, uh, two minutes, let me just say this uh, uh, as a minister. One of the things that has really, really been heartening and uh, encouraging is as each one of you are uh, here represented is all of the people uh, that Dr. White and I have worked with over the last five years in this program who do not see ministry or how they should respond to children as limited either to their own biological children or to the children who are in the church. Because a lot of the, 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 the children that we're talking about in foster care. They're not in mosques, they're not in synagogues, and they're not in church. And one of the really, really encouraging things uh, has been to see people of faith have a sense where that love that we should have extends beyond our own biological children or the children whom we worship with. And so uh, with that, I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Bishop Nelson, but it has been really, really gratifying. Uh, and I know a number of people who are here uh, who are uh, working with us. Uh, uh, Cassandra, who is, and, and I think uh, uh, Lasagna is here too, right? Uh, and, and, and others uh, 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 whom we work with in the project. But as, as Dr. Wyatt said, we're looking to have, in, in 2014, we're looking to have 15 churches or 15 places of worship. And, and, and we're, we're now represented in all five boroughs. Bishop Nelson. Thank you. Um, first, I want to uh, thank Dr. Wyatt and um, Dr. Mason for this invitation. It seems the longer I'm around um, um, Dr. Alphonse uh, Wyatt, his name becomes more closer to Abraham because every other person, that's my daughter, that's a, so um, I acknowledge it, it's, it's, it's a sign of invest, you invest today and you never know in the future. I um, surely also want to acknowledge my wife who's here with me. But I, I, I came to the, the whole idea of foster care a number of years, um, not just in my more recent work with Casey. Um, I had the privilege of pastoring a congregation in Ottawa, Canada for eight and a half years. 
and in Ottawa, which is not Toronto, and it's not, not um, like Montreal. Ottawa is very, very European. Um, I passed the congregation, which was composed mostly of Caribbean and African descent. And um, somewhere in the journey, discovered that there was um, this promo to recruit foster parents who were ethnic, or at least more culturally co um, connected with the children in care. So as a pastor who believes that the essence of our job, our work, our calling, is not limited to the four walls. I think a challenge with many houses of worship, as was just recently said, is that our primary focus is on those within. Um, so philosophically, I come somewhat off the mark because I believe the church is the only institution that invests thousands of dollars in buildings we only use on Sundays, maybe Wednesdays, maybe Friday nights. And so I've always believed that whatever facilities my congregation owns should be available to the community. So I began recruiting foster parents in Canada and um, discovered that nobody has, uh, no one, you did, there wasn't a passion in terms of, um, we had young, young um, African um, Canadians um, being um, fostered by individuals who cared for them, had compassion, but in terms of the cultural um, support, they were disconnected from the culture from which these children were um, taken. So our congregation became very much engaged with that. And we, I found it extremely rewarding. And as again, most of these children were not within the congregation, but whatever forum I was privileged to participate in, I began recruiting, um, I became the unofficial ambassador for Children's Aid Society in terms of recruiting foster parents. Well, when, we, when the family and I moved to New York 10 years ago, that was one of my priorities. Um, when they were fielding for pastors, and they wanted to know, what's your philosophy? How do you see ministry? I made it very clear that I was not the pastor just to preach, do Bible studies. I was the pastor who believes if the church was closed the next day and the community didn't miss what the church offered, we were wasting time. So basically we became engaged, um, Nigel, Yolanda, many of these. I reached out to them. I didn't wait until ACS found us. We reached out to them and offered them um, not only our facilities, but I, all, I began to recruit foster parents and adoptive parents. Um, they have access, we, we serve over 1,500 individuals, and so they have an, any, any time, there's a, an opportunity to have somebody from ACS or some foster care or child related agency to make a promotion in my congregation, the, the, we always make um, it possible. So the, the, our partnership with Casey has really furthered our vision. So with all of the various ministries we provide, we have a family support ministry, which would address issues of singlehood, divorce, couples. So we do the yearly couples retreats. We do the programs for men, empowering men, women, etc. Then we discovered, wait here a minute, something is missing. Um, uh, we needed to adopt or incorporate the foster program within the family program of the church. And so out of our partnership with Casey, um, we were able now to get additional resource uh, uh, in terms of a seminarian, as well as a stipend to help facilitate some of the things we do. But just the partnership with Casey um, has been a tremendous help. Um, as I've also indicated, Whoever is in charge, whether it's a church, a mosque, a synagogue, if the leader of that house of worship has not bought into the foster care program, no promotion is going to make any difference. But when a pastor or a rabbi or a leader is able to share with others and help them understand that it really doesn't undermine the commitment or the vision, but in a sense furthers it. And so it has been my pleasure um, to do my part for ACS in the field because I believe at the end of the day if the next generation is not in a healthier place because of our engagement we have walked a lonely journey so this is something we're committed to we endorse the work of ACS and the agencies and surely Casey um, our congregation has been tremendously blessed 
We have recruited several foster parents from within and without, and, and we've also had programs where we invited foster parents, as we did um, a Sunday, uh, two Sundays ago, where we honored this woman who, had, who was fostering six children. She's not a part of the congregation, but we want to say to her, the investment you make in the life of one of these children, we want to say thank you. And we want to say now, not years later. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to be here. Oh, hold on. You're going to be glad. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pastor Darrell Thomas, and I, I'm an assistant pastor at Christ Church International in Jamaica, New York. And I work as one of the seminarian uh, interns. And um, I, I intern at a, a, a house of worship in Jamaica, actually right across from the 40s projects. Um, this initiative, when I look at church, because I'm one of those people that feel like sometimes we need to redefine some things. And I've been looking at church, and I think we've gotten to the place, and this is just from my experience, we've gotten to the place where we, have, we are desensitized to what goes on outside the four walls of the church. And I've often said that when you look at the history of our, of our people, of our community, anything that was impacting the community, the church was involved in, and we're getting away from that. And we need to get back to that. There are a lot of broken children, a lot of broken families, and they need someone to turn to. So what this internship, what I do is, I work with a pastor at a, at a local house of worship, and my job is to connect them to the resources uh, where they, these families and these young people can get the assistance that they need. Um, the church that I intern at, they actually have a very large foster care population. So I'm working diligently to try to get them the services, and what, what we have is, what we're finding is that there are a lot of grandparents that are actually raising their own children. So we're, 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 we have, we're doing a, a presentation actually on the 12th that ACS is going to uh, host and we're bringing in someone from the Department of Aging to talk to the grandparents and let them know what resources are there for them. Because uh, a lot of them don't know that there are resources available to them. Um, and, and I just want to say that when what this work has done, it has given me, it has redefined ministry for me. Um, a lot of times we're, you know, and again, I'm speaking from my experience, we're sitting in the church and we're fighting over titles and all these other things. And the, there's a world outside those, those walls that people are just dying. And so this has given me a passion for ministry. If I may say so, this has, this, this work that I do, it has kept me sane in ministry. Um, it's, it's, it's. Because when I, when I look at it, I say, okay, am I, you know, we, I'm a person that I believe you have to take some self-evaluations every now and then. And so I ask myself the question every now and then, am I really doing what God is calling me to do? And when I was asking myself the question, Dr. Wyatt, a.k.a. Abraham, picked up the phone, <laughs> and emailed me, and he called me, and he said, I think you can do this. And I said, okay. And as I began, I said, you know, this is something. My wife was really, really involved in it, and I was kind of getting bits and pieces. And when I got my feet into it, I said, this is exactly what I was looking for. This has actually made me sane as far as ministry and serving goes. Um, I will say this, um, our, our young people, and I say this to everyone here respectfully, our young people are hurting. Yes. They are suffering. They are calling our names. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to really band together and answer the call. And I'll end with this. There was a young man, did, never met him, a co-worker of ours, gave this to my wife today, and he kept this to himself. His nephew, Nairon Cheddar. This tears me up. January 3rd, 1990, November 22nd, 2013. This young man took his own life. College graduate, honor student. But yet there was a pain that someone didn't recognize. And this is the note that he left, and I'm going to read it. Don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. I'm following the path of God laid for me. I took his hand, and when I heard him call, I turned my back and left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work, or play. Tasks left undone must stay that way. 
I found that place at the close of a day. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart and share with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. So he felt as though freedom for him was to take his own life. So I asked myself, what kind of pain was he in? <clears throat> what kind of agony was he in that we just were too busy to see? Or we just overlooked? And that's the question that we have to ask for a lot of our young people today. As a father of three, two college graduates, one 12 year old, I have a responsibility, as the bishop said, to go outside of my own house. God has been good to me. Now, it's, now we have to give back. And I love what you said, Bishop, because my bishop says the same thing. He asked a question. He asked the leadership a question one day. Mm. If the doors of the church close, my, 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 my. would the community miss us? Mm. And that's a question that we all really have to ponder. Our young people are suffering. They are hurting. They are crying. It's time for us to heed their cries. Thank you. It's an honor to be here before you. I have worked in child, with families and children since 1978. I was a little kid when I started, right? Mm -hmm. But however, I have seen the faces that I see in this room. Each one of you represent the nationality and the religion and the heart of a child, of a family who's been through child welfare. Seeing families that have been put through the system there's always, an, and we don't know if that young man had been in foster care, but I do know when we look at our children, how we raise them, how we love them. Every child is asking, do you love me and where's the security? ACS has bridged the gap between the community and the child welfare service with the community partnership. But at the bottom of that bridge is a foundation, and that foundation is the church. If we don't reach out to these children, who will? When we do it to the least of these, we do it unto God. Each one of these faith organizations represented here, we have an obligation as individuals, as a faith community, to reach out. I came into child welfare after working in homeless services. And there was young, one man in particular, he was 18, 17 actually, but he had been in 16 foster homes. Our children are not to be passed from home to home. I've worked with hundreds of birth parents whose children were in foster care. And one of the biggest hurdles for a parent is for someone not to raise their child with the belief that they have indoctrinated to their child. So if you put a child in a home that doesn't believe as you do, something's missing. If you feed them a different food than what their culture has perpetuated, what they're used to having, something's missing. If you don't pray the way my dad and my mommy prayed, there's something missing. So no matter what faith you represent in this house, open the doors to those families. The community visiting hosts are people who have said we would volunteer, people such as yourself, who volunteer to be at those community visits. That's the greatest gift that ACS can give a family, that can give a child's visitation with their family. And people from your congregation that will be trained as community visiting hosts will sit in there, will guide them, will pray for them, and most of all would love them. Because that's what missing, hurting people, hurting families, broken families, are missing one ingredient, someone to love them. So in new congregations, as I come out, and hopefully we'll be invited to train them, to let them know what the community visiting host is all about. It's being God's hands extended. It's caring for families where maybe no one else will encourage them besides you. That hand on that shoulder, that word of encouragement and you can do it. Statistics have proven that just the presence of someone in that room 
to encourage them, someone who looks like them, someone who believes in them, someone who will just say a few encouraging words that you can make it. I care about you. I care about your family. So open your hearts today. It's not asking a lot. It's just asking to be there. It's asking to encourage. It's asking to put an arm on someone's shoulder. To be objective in what you see and what you hear. To let them know that I am with you. You know, we can tell people that God loves you, but until we show them love, we can show, tell them that God cares, but until we show them, we can say, I'm praying for you, but until you're there with them, holding their hands, and they feel your love and your presence, What does it mean? I believe God says, when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. And we are not only here to take over, to take, think about our own interests, but the interests of others. Let us begin as a church to esteem others better than ourselves. To take a time, because when you feed him, you do it unto the Lord. Whatever you give with your heart, you do it unto him. So just open your hearts today and be there for these families. Thank you. There you have a microcosm the Casey Initiative. There is a not-for-profit that's involved. That's the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. There is a, a foundation, that's Casey Family uh, Programs uh, Foundation. Uh, there are houses of worship, as you've heard. And there is a, a hookup with an education institution and or people who are pursuing higher education. And we try to uh, provide each house of uh, worship with an intern, uh, a person that can free up the leader uh, so that the leader does not have to do everything. If you are already immersed in the community and you already have a zillion and three things to do, uh, while this may sound nice, it may just sound like one more thing to do. But what I love is that we have a backup and we have a backup system in terms of uh, both the intern uh, both Dr. Mason and myself in uh, order to provide uh, technical assistance and people like uh, Sister Gore Veronica Gordon who has come on to teach and train how to be a host site. Uh, so I would hope one of your questions, I don't want to lead uh, uh, the panel, uh, uh, that would not, that would be disingenuous for me to ask uh, a question as to how do you become a host site. But I think somebody out there will ask that question. I, I, I feel it in the atmosphere. I feel it in the atmosphere, uh, Brother Hatim, that somebody gonna ask that question. Uh, Hatim and somebody's gonna ask that question. So, so what I'm gonna do in the time that we have is the same thing. I want you to line up at the mic I want you to ask a question. If it is a general question, anyone on the panel can ask. If it is a specific question to someone, please feel free to direct the question. Say your name uh, and your affiliation. Ask your question. Step back for the next person. I also uh, will counsel my panel of experts uh, that brevity, as Shakespeare said, brevity is the soul of wit. So, nah, I'll leave it there. All right, I'm well read, yes, that's right. So, let's get on the line right here. Uh, anybody got questions? And that's why I had you to, to hear that it can work in any house. So, whatever house you from, come on and ask your questions, step back, and we'll go and roll from there. 
Hi, I'll, I'll respond to Reverend Alfonso's request. I'm Elder Joan williams Jarrell from Bethel Gospel Assembly, and I'd like to know how do you become a whole site? A whole site? A whole site. That's correct. Just, you want Okay. Just come up afterwards, uh, give me your information, uh, and we'll be in touch with you. We are looking to expand in 2014, uh, and, and we'll be selecting additional uh, sites. Well, yes, and, but yeah. specifically, how do you train houses of worship to become a host oh. site? Okay. Well, we would come out, I would come out to your church, and we would have a training. There is a four-hour training initially with your people would take part in. And that will give them an overview of child welfare, what is safety in regards to the definition esteemed by child welfare, as well as the responsibilities and roles for community visiting homes. But, they will, but initially, they have to be cleared by the state central registry. Okay, so once your church decides that you want to be a part of it, we will come out, we will introduce it to your congregation, come out again and do a training for them. And there's subsequent trainings that we would allow, you know, that we would bring to your church. You're welcome. It would be nice if you could address this question. I'm contemplating um, the question that was made, er, uh, commentary that was made earlier in regards to eliminating or cutting the, the system in half within a given time span. My question then is, how do you hope to accomplish this, seeing that the task is extremely daunting? Part of the statistics that uh, were read this morning uh, when uh, uh, Brother Nigel Nathaniel presented, there used to be 50,000 young people in foster care. That's down to like 13,000 now. Part of what uh, uh, Casey has discovered over the last five years is that those numbers uh, have significantly been reduced uh, with the initiative that they have launched uh, five years ago. So that the, the way in which to accomplish it, I think uh, in, in large part is represented in this room. Uh, that uh, if, if, if as, as Bishop said, uh, Sister Gordon said, and, 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 and uh, Minister Darrell said, if we as religious persons and communities if we open those doors seven days and seven nights a week, if, if we do the community work that we are charged and called to do, that will reduce the numbers. I can't emphasize this enough. ACS cannot solve this problem. It does not begin with ACS. It certainly will not end with ACS. But as the institutions in our communities across the nation if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we're doing what we're called to do and charged to do, uh, we, can, we can reduce those numbers. And I'd like to add to that. Parent education is also a way to reduce those numbers. And what I've been doing is going, and others like myself, have been going out to schools, to churches, to mosques, to different institutions, anywhere that would open the door to educate people and how do I parent my child and such effectively parent my child in a defective world. Parent education is so important. Good afternoon. I want to thank um, all of you and all of you as a faith-based community as well as um, Casey Family and um, KCS uh, for offering foster care agencies um, the opportunities for uh, beginning relationships. But um, just like any relationship, right, um, you know, there's the opportunity for not sustain, you know, the issue of sustainability. And part of the experience that I've had in, since 1986 in child welfare is that we can begin a relationship um, and then there's some kind of uh, misunderstanding or breakdown um, usually, in my experience, around issues of um, crime, issues of drugs, issues of um, challenging or high needs behaviors, and the different ways that our institutions see, view, tolerate, and remediate those things. Can you give us an idea about how, whether it's in the visit hosting, or the volunteering, or the fostering, how you help your um, you know, your larger, broader community um, adjust 
and sustain through these kinds of difficulties in order for those relationships to be uh, lasting ones. Well, just a few words on that. I think you hit on uh, a very crucial point. Sustainability is always a vital part. Um, Earlier on, I had a few comments um, with um, Dr. Mason, the same thing. Because if you look, for example, at ACS, ACS is a massive bureaucracy. The leadership will change from time to time. However, there are community agencies plus um, houses of worship, which are in the trenches year after year. They're not going anywhere, um, regardless of who the mayor is, regardless of who the governor is, and which is why I preface my comments with my experience back in Canada. That may seem to have a disconnect with where we are now, but the point is, is to show life vision. And so when I stand before my congregation, if I can recruit um, individuals who will probably raise their children and are still young enough to foster, um, the idea is to keep generating, uh, keep it for the people, that, that it's not only a problem, but they're also a part of the solution. So again, the problem is not out there, or the solution is not someone coming in to rescue us. We ourselves as a community must take ownership with, in terms of the welfare of our children. And, um, and, and another point, um, we, I, I work before full-time ministry, I worked as a, as, a, as a psychotherapist in a mental health um, center. So I come at ministry from different angles. But what I've come to realize is that most people take for granted the resources which are available in house of worships. Um, the individuals, whether they're churches, mosques, whatever, who want to give back, they just don't know how to. And many times agencies are suspicious of churches or a house of worship because the assumption is your engagement is about proselyting. Um, so I've, I've stood on both sides. And so w when we promote foster care, it has nothing to do, I said to my congregation, our strength has nothing to do with how many bodies are in the building. The question is, how are we impacting the community? So when we do, when we promote foster, I have, I celebrate the uh, individuals in our church, who and, and and some are even single, who have taken the challenge, and have not only fostered but are now adoptive parents. We celebrate them because for me that is serious ministry. So our house of worships have an untapped resource that agencies like ACS, Casey, and others can tap into for the long haul. Mm -hmm. Let me just make one comment in terms of the importance of uh, community. And integrating what we're talking about with community. When we started this program, this was uh, five years ago, we had many clergy persons around the table meeting with ACS who were very candid about what the community's understanding and the reputation that ACS and all of you who've been around New York a number of years know the various names that it had prior to ACS. But the basic point was ACS uh, and the prior uh, agency names, they come in to take your children. That was the basic community response that was articulated at, around those uh, conferences from pastors. The reality now, five years later, having worked with some of the persons who you heard present here today, and having actually uh, uh, been engaged over the last five years, those same pastors are not only seeing a different way of understanding what the work of ACS is, but Bishop are, are talking about that and preaching about that in the community very differently. That we work with Yolanda, we work with Dale, we work with Nigel, we, we have been engaged for these number of years. We have seen how they don't come in to take your children. All of you who see how these things play out in the media, the first agency that we blame for whatever happens in any family, whether it be known or not known by ACS, is what did ACS do? So that we have a zero tolerance for anything happening to any family. 
But our understanding over the last five years in working with them, just to reemphasize it is, we have a responsibility as people of faith to basically help to solve this problem because these are our children in our communities and our children are not limited to our biological children or the children who are in our communities of faith. Before you ask, uh, ask your question, one of the, where's my sister at? Where, where, where are you? Well, one of the beauties of this initiative is the role that this young man plays. Because 20, 30 years out, those seminarians who were students mm. will be leaders. That's right, that's right. Past. And they're going to take the vision and run with it. They're going to understand that it's not just about anniversaries and programs. They're going to have their hands tilled in the soil. Mm -hmm. Great point. They're going to be able to look at things beyond, this is beyond funding. Mm -hmm. Love cannot be funded. Funded. <laughs> it will preach. <laughs> and I'm going to go first. <laughs> so, I was a vice president of a foundation for 22 years. So my whole thing was sustainability. My whole thing was metrics. My whole thing was, 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 was. But let me tell you what is, 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 is. There is no force more powerful than faith. There is no force that is able to overcome when people believe that something is not only a pop probable, but that it is more than possible. Yeah. And when people have a mind to work, and when they move as one, and when they understand that if there is no enemy inside, then the enemies outside can never harm, then powerful things happen. So while we're here doing this, it is with a vision way down the road. I think one of the great things about being a faith leader is the ability to impact the lives of people that you will never meet and still show up every day. Imam. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a, a brief comment. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, Reverend Dr. Mason earlier. And um, when we talk about the idea of disproportionate disparity in terms of the numbers of children in the foster care system, shrinking from 50,000 to about 13, there are some untold stories that we need to kind of look at because certain people are not at the table in the conversation. And what, what I'll say is that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of delighted that Dr. Wyatt, that you're there, and also Dr. Mason. But I'll share this with you. Um, as a faith, as well as a clinical person, and a clinical psychologist, about maybe four years ago, or some time before that, a couple came to me. And they were having issues about relationship, communication, and the like. And there came a point in the conversation where there was antagonism between the two of them. So the wife was very adamant about certain things. So the husband said, I want to say something to you. I said, I'm open for that. I'm always open for stuff. So he said, let me say this to you, professor. At my age, I never experienced being raised by a mother and a father. I, I was raised all my life by the institution. This brother happened to be Muslim. His wife hearing this for the first time, she kind of does lost it, started crying. And he said, I've been trying to say this for a long period of time. So what happens in terms of the disproportionate numbers, African-American children overrepresent the children in the system. But there is a lack of cultural differentiation when you look at the numbers, because African-American children who are Muslim are also in that number. So although we have shrunk the number from 50 to 13, what about along the way those kids that are traumatized based upon that experience, like the young brother did. We don't know those numbers. So it's kind of interesting that a dialogue is taking place, but yet still the faces of the indigenous African-American Muslims are not at the table. 
So those are things for us to consider because I'm saying that we have been at this for a number of years and so I'm hoping that post this conversation we can have some real dialogue moving forward on this because it's a very important issue. Thank you. Ima, thank you for, for your candor. Uh, the reason that we're presenting this and the reason I asked you to repeat after me this can work in any house of worship is to your point that yes there is an overrepresentation of African American and Latino but African American youth as we begin to look at disproportionality the reality of the day is that New York City has uh, I went back to my high school my high school as principal for a day and I asked the real principal, how many nations are in this school? And he said, 143 languages are spoken in the high school that I attended some years ago. Mm, I ain't saying no numbers. So if we have a module or a model that worked when I was in high school, and all of these changes has happened, have, have occurred, and there's been no change, then interventions will not be effective. I learned in that same high school, what you do on one side of the equation, you must do on the other side. What today is, is an attempt to balance out the side of the equation. There is absolutely, and I've already talked to my brother Hatim, there is absolutely no reason that this model cannot work mm -hmm. in other communities. Now, and, and one of the strong tenets of the Rabbi Marshall Meyer uh, uh, retreat that I, even to this day, even though I'm not involved with it uh, day to day, is that it is not a clubhouse. It's not some favorite over others. This is just one model that you're getting a real-time glimpse. But it does not mean that it cannot work in other houses of worship that want it to work. So we're breaking new ground. And anytime you break new ground, there's nervousness. Uh, a, a sense of what if, or who is, or how can it be. But if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, if you take one step, every journey happens with a step. I'm hoping that within the X amount of time that there are five different iterations of this particular model that is culturally sensitive. And let me kind of wind this down with my brother, who is my new friend, uh, uh, there's the next workshop is going to deal with cultural competency and how and I'm not saying the ACS has the market on how to incorporate and be culturally competent given 143 nations but we have to begin somewhere sir thank you for being so patient as I die and try <laughs> Just before you start, can, can I just make an announcement? Uh, uh, Dr. Image Jordan Simpson, uh, could all of the clergy please stand? Of all, faiths. of all faiths. Could all of the clergy of all faiths please stand? Let me just say this. I know we had said that we were talking about expanding to 15. Dr. Wyatt and I are going to talk with Howard Noel, and, and uh, I would like to ask all of you, uh, or each one of you who would want to participate in this program to please give me your information before we leave. Now, that's, that's why I ask you to stand. And I ask you to stand because we stand together. Thank you. Yeah. Well, listening to uh, all of you, I know you're all spiritual men and women and all of us here listening to you because you've gone beyond the scriptural text. <coughs> and you understand it and you're putting it to practice and i think that's a good defi definition of spirituality and this is what we need most of all and this in itself will radiate and 
uh, would be the cure for many of our problems. I come from Guyana, and I'm a Hindu monk, and our Guyanese community is having a difficult time. And one of those things is because of the disconnect between parents and children. We come from a different culture, and over here children, especially who are born from immigrants from the Caribbean, their environment that they brought up in is totally different. But yet, the parents are trying to uh, infuse that tradition that uh, they learned from and, and coming from that Guyana. So that disconnect is, is uh, causing a lot of trouble and causing, um, uh, like you'll say, many of the children, they're uh, moving out of their homes and living by themselves or living with relatives. So that is a, one of the problems. So I think we came up with this solution that the students uh, from the colleges and universities should be the root true leaders in the church because they understand both traditions and they understand the problem. And I think uh, we're seeing progress in that area. So I think this model might also be something that can work also. Well, I thank you and I thank you. I wanna just say, and I'm gonna turn it to Sarah if there's no other questions or comments. When I was young, there was a thing that was called the generation gap. How many of y'all remember that? Yeah. And the generation gap was the perceived uh, dissonance or the, the perceived distance between the young people and the elders. I want to say to every group that is here, whether you've been here all your life, some of your life, or just got here, there will always be a tension between young people in terms of where they are, what they want, and what their parents or elders believe. That's just part of being young. And unless we understand that as part of the cycle, and then begin to develop programs that are built on the reality and not on the myth, or not just on the expressed or uh, a desire of what we think should happen, we will continue to lose our young people. I went to Amsterdam, and I'm walking around thinking I'm gonna see windmills and clogs and, and wooden shoes. <laughs> and I saw young people rock and run DMC. Sagan wasn't out then, but if it was, their pants would be dropped. This culture here exports visually stuff that was never even invented in your lifetime. There was no internet when most of you, all of you, I ain't gonna say more, all of you uh, were, were young. But now we have ways for strangers. There are more ways for strangers to be in touch with young people that maybe except for you, daughter, uh, than ever existed in the annals of history. And it is exerting pressure, visual pressure on I want what I see. We have two more people, I'm gonna end it right there. Yes, ma'am, please step up. Your name and your question, please. My name is Chaplain Deborah Dickerson, and I'm from Life and Faith Sharing Associates, which is an interface. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, my question is, and I'm glad to see you, Bishop, it's such a, a, such a pleasure. Uh, my question is, being that we have so many of our older people, which are, grandpa which are grandparents, how does the Casey, the Casey family assist those, those grandparents, which a, a lot of our uh, faith-based churches have a lot, of uh, taking in some of their grandchildren, how does this assist? Because this is a big problem where sometimes the children, their children have, have substance abuse, problems and I see that this goes on quite a bit how would this help well we have right here stand up daughter 
We have right here a representative from uh, the Department of Aging. I've worked with the Department of Aging, have been a part of most of their grandparent uh, 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 initiatives. The reality, and you're gonna talk to her because I think that this question goes a little deeper than just a question. Uh, I, I got them kind of skills, you know. <laughs> Grandparents are in congregations, they are in mosques, they are in the ashram, they are, they are everywhere. So as the problem percolates up, then it has to be dealt with. If an issue comes forward that this group cannot handle, we have access through ACS, through the Department of Aging, we have access to get the, the, the issue solved. I'm gonna give you something else that you can write home about. What you pray for, I want you to listen to this now. What you pray for, your tax dollars probably already paid for. Mm. Did y'all get that? Okay, so, so, so that resource guy only, who asked me? My, my, my Hindi monk brother, you asked me, no, you asked me, no, you asked me for the resource guy. ACS, we gotta make sure that we find a link to get the resource guide so that you can see what resources are there. And when we do the workshop on cultural competency, that is a good way for you to be able to perhaps invite we got, now this is rare to have a pastor that's a psychotherapist and an imam that's a psychotherapist. We should be able to figure out some things <laughs> and be able to take it deeper. Yes, young man. Thank you. Uh, I'm Gregory Simpson. I'm a student over at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, my question is actually quite simple. I heard a little bit about the program. Um, and I wanted to know about some of the after, uh, uh, I guess you could call them after school support programs for foster kids um, that are offered, or if they are offered. One of the reasons why I asked, and as Bishop pointed out, is that a lot of the churches around here, they have a lot of space, they have a lot of, um, op there's opportunity to do a lot of things within the church, particularly in the area of education. So. I'd like to know a little bit more about what kind of services are offered uh, outside of uh, the typical services, uh, support services, but in, in terms of education in different areas, in the arts, in the sciences, maths, and so on. As, um, well, as mentioned earlier, I, I I'm an intern for a, a local church, but my church is also involved in the in the initiative. My wife is here; she's the intern for our church. And what we've raise your hand, Lasonia. That's right, man. And what we've been able to do, and, and I just kind of want to, if I could just backtrack to the question at the end, just kind of touch on that a little bit. What what this is one thing that our bishop teaches us all the time is that need and relationship have to be connected. When people have needs, we can't do this as a lone ranger. So if you look at how this setup is, you've got Casey Foundation, you've got Federation, you've got seminarian interns, you've got the local houses of worship that are connecting together. So through, through, those, through those relationships, we're able to tap into other resources because there, there may be resources that you have that I don't. So when we come together, we work together, then those resources are released. So um, what my actual church did is we have, I think it's called the Negro, what, the Council for Negro Women, I believe. The, the, the National, National Council. National Council. Council. They, they, through our relationship with uh, ACS and Jamaica Community Partnerships, they were looking for a place to do an after school program because they had an original place, but something happened with that. So our church for the past two years has allowed them to come in and now they have an after school program at our facility from 3 to 5.30, uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So, but again, this would have never, we, again, like the bishop said, we want to be in a position where we can open up our doors to the community. Because again, you know, our, our ministry, we're always doing something. Um, I think Monday is the only day that there's nothing going on in the church, the offices are closed, but we have people that are willing to 
sit and assist that program just to be a presence there, a security, a presence there, whatever. And we do, we do, we, this is our second year doing this. So, but again, it wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to offer that if there had not been the connection between the relationships and the partnerships that we formed. So I think what happens is these partnerships and these relationships, they open up other avenues and other doors. I mean, it's not, our program is not specifically for, uh, not specifically for children in foster care, but it's open to anyone that signs up through that through, through that council or that group of the women, and 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 and, we're, and you know we're, we're more than willing to do it. It's it's a, it's been working out. Um, a lot of the parents have come, and they you know they've said to me because I've actually sat sometimes just to cover, and they've said to me we, we thank you for opening these doors. You don't know how blessed. And the program is free. It's free to the parents. So and in, in, in these these stressful economic times, that's always an added benefit. And, and, and just to go to show you that I'll close up, even on, on our church in the lobby, we have a huge table and it's got information all over that table. And one of the grandparents, he said to me, you know, I thank God for this program. I said, okay. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, you had some information on this table one day. He said, and I have two grand grandsons. Oh, they're a little bit older. He said, and I didn't really know what the program was. But he said, you had some information on this table he said, I was able to, with that information, I was able to get them some, some, some financing and get them back into college. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, right. it's, it's the relationship that, that's meeting the need. Uh, two additional points to, to your question. Uh, we do have seminarians from Union Theological Seminary. One of our seminarians, uh, who is a professional drummer out in Brooklyn uh, at First Baptist Church, uh, Crown Heights, she has a drum line uh, of several young people who uh, I think it's about 30 or so who are now learning how to uh, play the drums and, and has created a drum line, uh, kind of a drum line ministry there for the last year and a half, year and a half. Right. And one of our uh, sites, a new site, has a full gymnasium about the size of this room. <laughs> uh, and they let the community use all of the facilities um, that are there. So imagine, uh, and there's a housing project right across the street. This is in the heart of Brooklyn. And imagine all of the young people who are able to use. We're not saying in conclusion that this is the bee's knees, the last word in programming, but it is an honest attempt to build something on the strength of partners that come together to work together to make something bigger happen than e any other entity on its own could ever profess to do. I want to thank you and I want you to give a hand to our panelists.